July 15th, extra time on YouTube, driven by Continental. David Goss here in the MLS at t studios with three pure experts at the desk. Breaking down the Derby de New York, New York, as well as whether the San Jose earthquakes are for real. Sorry, I had nowhere to go off of that. <laughs> Oh my god, Bobby went serious and it caught everyone oh. off guard. Welcome everybody to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in New York City. David Goss, Matt Doyle, Bobby Warshaw, do not touch the button on my microphone. <laughs> and Mr. Kalen Carr himself, currently applying to live in Brooklyn, so therefore sporting his Brooklyn shirt, attempting to get into what would be the most prestigious university and place in your life, right? Absolutely, yeah. Please put in a good word. Yeah, I'll work on it if I can as a native. So I was surprised that you went from that you went with live from New York City instead of like Midtown Manhattan. I didn't say live. You, you, right, you didn't say live. But you said from New York City instead of New York, New York, which yeah. is obviously Bobby's thing. Yep. Um, I would have thought Midtown Manhattan. No. I would have thought the Matt, Big Apple. From New York, New York, or no, New no, York? No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me get his mic off. Uh, I'm not proud of being in Midtown Manhattan right now, so it's not something I would rep. It's like kind of one of the worst. Places a, but if we were up in like Washington Heights. Oh, if we were in Harlem right now, baby. Okay. Yeah, Washington Heights. Wake up in Washington Heights. Yeah, I would exactly go there. Okay. Oh, you had kind of an, you were off this weekend. Do you feel relaxed? What yeah. Is, it, what is an off weekend yeah, for Matt Doyle? What? Sat down and I watched 48 hours of soccer. That sounds like an off <laughs> the weekend. The only difference was that I had my cats with me okay. instead of you guys. Okay. So it was better company. Were you locked in for Tunisia, Sen Senegal? Uh, I actually didn't get to watch Tunisia Senegal. Oh my God, I thought you were I did watch. Me a I did watch Algeria versus uh, Nigeria. Better crowd there. Better crowd there, and and what a filthy goal! And then an even better tweet afterwards. What's the tweet? Uh, there was a right wing politician in France who was basically tweeted something like, "I don't want." Algeria to win. I'm rooting Nigeria so that uh, for Nigeria so that we don't have to see Algerian flags all over France. Wow. Mara scores the goal and then he quote tweets it with this one was for you, buddy. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Let's go. Riyad Mahrez having a big day. It was an epic weekend in MLS. Week 19, we had rivalries, we had big matchups, national TV, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We're going to hit on it all and then we've got a little bit transfer rumor, some other stuff going on that we'll mention and then we've got a great mailbag coming up as well. Let's start with the weekend Bobby I want to know for you guys who made the biggest statements and I had like three or four games pegged Bobby came in the office first asked him the question didn't say one of those games mm. so I'm pumped about this Bobby who do you have David with the number one overall pick in this game I would like to take Real Salt Lake four to nothing winners over Philadelphia this felt like another step forward for this team throughout most of the year guys I would generally categorize in my brain this Real Salt Lake team and I would actually say last year, maybe the year before as well, as a street team. They felt like they were a street balling team without a ton of foundation of what they were doing. Incredibly talented, and it worked for them at times, including the big win, the playoffs over LAFC, but just not a ton of structure. They've developed that structure over the last five games. Three wins, a tie, and a loss, but in every single game, they've looked a little bit better defensively, and that new defensive solidity has allowed the attackers to thrive. Jefferson Severino with a huge performance. This felt like a big win, a big step forward for Real Salt. So earlier in the year, I would have said RSL's identity was, like the only thing they, they really did well was switch the field of play. Um, and they would often go like wing to wing. It wasn't necessarily, we think of like Will Trapp or Michael Bradley, so, but it was like Bofo Saceda would have it on one side and he would just bang it across the field to Saverino on the other side. This time it was more over the top, Bobby, especially that first goal. Yeah, it was. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to think about where to take that question. Um, it was, although I don't think that's the talking point about this team. Sam Johnson, they've definitely become better at stretching the field. Originally, for the last two years, I thought RSL would be at their best with a target striker who sits there and allows Jefferson Severino or Corey Baird or Jao Plata to run off them. That's been a bit a little bit changed. But they're better off now when they clear off that middle of the field, either with Sam Johnson running behind himself or Demir Krylak just getting out of the way altogether for those players to run behind. Matt, I think that's a detail that comes from the other part. This is a team now that is defensively solid, and everything else is a little detail, a little auxiliary part that comes off of that. So you're right, it's just not where my head was at with this team. When you take it, or at least me going to simplify this a little bit, though, is you also need the quality in the attack, like individually. Severino went to Copa America and played some of the best soccer we've ever seen him play. Yeah. Now he comes back, he hears the rumors like we do. Might get to play for Steve Bruce. Of what that next move <laughs> might be. But you, with him, it's been consistency. Like That's what you're looking for. 
this could be the motivation and now the confidence for him to be the player we want him to be going forward, at least for a large stretch for RSL as they look in this window. That's the hope, but RSL has a month like this every single yeah. year. Yeah, <laughs> That's the hard part about this. Jefferson Severino does this three times a year. Yep. He's like Albert Elise. If him and Albert Elise are sharp, their teams win. They're nearly impossible to stop. But in the same way, they almost handicap their teams because how many times aren't they sharp and how do you build around a game plan? And it when was you're... the same thing with Joao Plata. Yeah. Joao Plata would have six months or six weeks every every year where he's the best player in the league. He's and, about to have it. And then he would take the rest because of the year Because they're off. about to trade him finally. <laughs> and now he's going to pop out and have it. And then they're like, well, we can't trade him now. And then it's going to go away. I guess the point I'm just generally trying to make is I think that RSL has moved past that. That yeah. they've found other ways to be a good team without just relying on those wingers to score them goals. A dominating home win against the Philadelphia Union. They move into the playoff places this weekend. Kalen Carr, you are up with the second pick. Who made a statement this weekend? And I'm not listening. Uh, with the second pick in the draft, I'm going to take Toronto FC. And uh, I think uh, you're able to see what they did against Montreal on the road and uh, just all their pieces coming together, what that team could potentially look like. Um, Omar Gonzalez had a nice debut in the middle of the, of the back for them, and then Josie and Michael. But Josie and Pozuelo, when those two are together, I, I think they could be the two top tandems uh, in MLS as far as their partnership goes. And then I think there's also been some nice moves, a little underrated moves. Nick DeLeon, I think, has been really, really good for this team throughout the season. Um, and I think a guy that, when you look towards the playoffs, uh, is a guy that can come up with a big moment. So I, I think Toronto FC could be the team of the second half of the season. I, I think they, could, they really have the potential to make a run all the way up to the top of the Eastern Conference. And to add to that, Kalen, I went back through their games in the last three, three years. I think it was the first time they have played with Josie Altador on the field in a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-3-3. Pretty much every time he's been on the field, it's been with Joe Vinco or Pasuelo earlier in the year, and it was in a two-striker set, either the 4-4-2 diamond or a 3-5-2, which may or may not matter long term. It just feels like a, a significant changing of the guard for the organization right now. But it's also something that Vanny wants, right? But You spoke with him in preseason, I believe. And he said that's how he sees that was, it. That was the drift that I got, that he would prefer to have more width via the wingers, more pace out there, more players to open the game. But when you have Jovinko, you play the way Jovinko. Right. It's not only that. Josie's always said he prefers a two-forward system. Like he, he has been clear and upfront about that, and we saw in that first half. Why? Because it, Montreal did a good job of having that 4-3-3, basically three defensive midfielders, sit there in zone 14 and push Pozuelo out. And Pozuelo had to drop deep into the left to get on the ball. And there was this just huge gap between him and Josie. They couldn't link up at all. Josie couldn't find the ball. There had to be rotations from the other guys, either from uh, really De Leon, the right-sided winger, coming in and acting as that second-pure attacker, or one of Bradley or Delgado pushing up. It took about 40 minutes for them to solve it, to, for them to solve those rotations. And I think that's promising. Um, I, I still question, though, whether this team uh, is going to be the type of thundering juggernaut they would need to be to, to climb that high in the Eastern Conference. Even though they have the talent, it just still looks so mechanical from them. I want to touch the Josie part real quick because Josie needs another striker because Josie doesn't run behind. Yep. He never, ever, and he, I shouldn't say. Well, that's he did, what this new Venezuelan guy is. Well, that's for. the goal. He did a little bit in those first couple games with Pasuela. He would fade off the back shoulder on that Joseph Martinez run. It was really the first time that I remember him doing that type of thing. A center midfielder picks up the ball, and he is the one to run behind, opposed to him be the one to post up the center backs or to check back in midfield. Did when he, you, never mind. What? Didn't they win 2017 MLS Cup on like three goals with him running behind on through balls? But they're close to goal. They're like in front of goal. Got it. Right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, but Columbus, Seattle, I don't. I mean, the game-winning goal. That's fair. Either way. It, it but might, yes, that's what, okay, it might happen moments. every now and then. Maybe I shouldn't sort of never happened. But his tendency is almost always to come back. So when you have Josie as your striker, you need someone, either another striker or a winger, to run behind him. So that's the next thing they have to solve because Pasuelo isn't that guy. He's not running behind Josie. Hopefully it's it's not Shaffelberg You don't want either. him doing that. You want Pasuelo on right. the ball as much as possible, dictating things. It almost looks like they can do something like... Uh, what Seattle does with that strong left side overload because you know Pozuelo wants to drift out there. They have Justin Morrow on the overlap who can 
I mean, he can give you all the width that you want. I just I'm not convinced about their their wingers as of yet. The new guy who's coming in, the the Gallardo, the Venezuelan guy, needs to be very good for this team to be elite. So it was a fantastic weekend of soccer, and we've already talked about two big winners won their games, proved what they could do. Fans are happy. Doyle will now continue that happiness here with your selection, which will be positive and uplifting for a fan base. Biggest statement of the weekend, without question, was from the Houston Dynamo, and the statement was, "We're not going to make the playoffs." They had a home. Cool. Like, so that their positivity whole, thing. Their their whole their whole argument for being a playoff team was we're unbeatable at home, because uh, they they are one of the league's worst road teams year after year after year. Um, but they've been great at home to start the season, and Dynamo fans were shouting at us in March and April, and even the first half of May. Why don't you guys have us top three in the power rankings? Look at our points per game, and we said. These power rankings, man. Yeah, right? <laughs> they People get you are freaking trouble. out over these power rankings. We, we said, just wait. Let's see what happens when you get into this, you know, the, the real tough stuff of, of the season. Well, uh, on the road so far, the Houston Dynamo are 1-7-0. and So they have to win all their home games. And on Friday night, they played LAFC without Carlos Vela, without Eduard Atuesta, without Walker Zimmerman. They had three starters. The best attacker, the best midfielder, and the best defender in the league this year. Everyone else rotated as well. Blessing only played a half. 35 minutes, I think, for, for Rossi. One minute for Eddie Segura. This was essentially a USL team against Houston's First choice lineup, and the Dynamo figured out how to lose three one at home. I don't think I think that's a big statement. Lee Wynn and Diamande, those those are USL players to you. Yeah, that was I mean, harsh. That was harsh. Fair enough. Fair get enough. the point, but that was harsh. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't get the point actually because that that's my point. What I mean, LAFC is even when they rotate, they have some quality players to be able to. Put they in. do. They do. They're not a USL team, but the idea was these are the backups. This is a team. If you're a playoff, if you're a playoff team. You have to win this game, and I agree with that. And the, and, they, and the Dynamo were wasteful too. I mean, they had a lot of opportunities to be able to put this game away. Uh, I think you should also probably give some credit to Mohamed El Munir on that yeah. basically game-saving uh, goal line tackle on Elise there. But yeah, the Dynamo it was a huge missed opportunity there. And if you allow LAFC time, they're eventually going to hurt you. And they put in some of their players in the second half. They put in Rossi, they put in Vela, they put in some guys. And uh, the, mo- the moment was missed. I, 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 I disagree that the Dynamo aren't going to make the playoffs, uh, but I, I do think this it, they should be uh, criticized by Matthew Doyle uh, this week. So Noted MLS that. expert. Yes. Noted MLS expert. We will get to that in just a moment. For LAFC, less than 48 hours after getting knocked out of just say, I just want to say, six home games left for the Dynamo. If they win out... They're on 45 points for the year. Went out at home. 45 points might not do it. In the Western Conference for the playoffs. Western Conference for the playoffs. It's moving a lot right now. Those playoff spots are moving a lot, both in the East and the West. We'll talk about that more in a second. One of the teams that is currently in the Western Conference playoffs is the San Jose Earthquakes. For the second time in two weeks, they won a Cali Classico. This one wasn't exactly simple. They gave up a goal in the opening two minutes to L.A. on the road. So you think it's going to be difficult. They come back in the second half. They figure things out. And it turns out uh, someone messaged us and said, Ibrahimovic just got vacoed. (laughs) <laughs> so there you go. Are you all in on the San Jose Earthquakes? Yeah, I think if you look back to the start of April, they're maybe third in the league in points per game. Um, they've gotten ants. You know, they they benched Wando at the start of this. This was a start of the run. They benched Wando. They changed their defense. They changed their midfield, and Wando could have quit on the team. Uh, there are veterans who would have done that, and he didn't. And I think that speaks to what Mel- Matias Almeida has built out of these guys. Um, and when the chance was there for Wando to come back in, he took it. And then now he's slumping again. Danny Houston comes in. Danny Houston's a difference maker. Uh, it's, they're winning with about 25 different guys. Anibal Godoy goes down. He's a you know, World Cup veteran. Okay, plug in the next guy. Uh, they, they killed the Galaxy. 32-5 to five in shots? I'm, I, I believe in this team. For sure. I was shocked the Galaxy were going to play an open game with San Jose like that because it, it really started. They probably didn't mean to. Well, <laughs> There's yeah. no way they meant to do no, that. No, but they, they let the game get stretched, and that was always going to favor San Jose. That That's not a game plan that the Galaxy are able to to play. So uh, Mar- Martinez and Vaco 
I mean, those two have been amazing. Uh, and Vaco has been really inconsistent in years past. He hasn't always been able to step up to be the player that he is. But if he can carry this forward, San Jose has a real chance. I, I personally have some questions about them and whether this is sustainable and whether I'm seeing it. I know Bobby keeps telling me that this, these are repeatable things that are just going to continue to happen. But I do think we do see how quickly things change in MLS. We saw at the beginning of the year their form wasn't there. Now Matias Almeida's system is really like the belief has caught on. But I, I still can't forget some of those games. I know LAFC has done it to an, pretty much everybody this season. But I, I still have question marks as far as can they defend? Can they defend on the wings? Can they compete against a team that's able to really get behind? Because they they win when they put their style of play on other teams, and I'm not sure they can do that against every team in the West. Yeah, especially once they play them again, and especially once that second time around is when teams are desperate for playoff points. I mean, this is the second time around against the Galaxy in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's not quite in a desperation mode yet for these teams. And, and, I, and I would also argue that the, the game against LAFC, the, the U.S. Open Cup game against LAFC, for sure, was amazing. For that sure. was one, I mean, the, the LAFC ended up winning just because they had that little extra special w- with Carlos Vela, but the Quakes pushed LAFC every bit as hard as, as Portland did. Yeah, I'm with Matt that I think that San Jose are for real and that it's going to keep going, but I'm definitely a little bit concerned about this idea, and I would put New England into this bucket, maybe Orlando, that when teams start to take you seriously, it makes it much tougher. And the Galaxy, for everything around the Cali Classico, did not fully take San Jose seriously. You cannot, as you said, Kellen, get into an open game, and why teams continue to try and step high, continue high in press, continue to step and press. The New England Revolution, the New England Revolution, under Mike Lopper, drew 0-0 with this team because they didn't t- they didn't try and step up. They sat behind midfield, they sat in the middle block, and they said, we are not going to run and gun with you. And at some point, other teams are going to try and do that, right? At some point, other teams are going to take the earthquake seriously and actually address to them, address them, be pragmatic, and, and take advantage of San Jose's lapses. Houston did do that at home. Sorry, New England beat them 3-1. to one. It wasn't, right. sorry. But Houston did a similar thing at home, but Vaco had a couple special moments, which right now... No, no, no. Houston doesn't do it to anyone. <laughs> they don't, right? Okay. This is the other thing about Houston. It's insane that he, you go back to why Houston making the playoffs. If Houston did this, if Houston sat and countered, they would beat every team in the league. No, right? they wouldn't. Well, they would be very good. Whatever. They wouldn't beat every team in the league, obviously. But they would be very good. If they use their three combative center midfielders and Kyoto, Minotas, and Elise on the break, it's be, it's mind-boggling that they don't do this. And at some point, hopefully when these teams get desperate for points, they will start to do that to teams like San Jose. Bobby, you just want to, here at Extra Time, we just want to play open, attacking, high press, you know, flowing soccer, okay? That's the way the game. You can be entertaining to me while taking also counterattacking. The Colorado just, Rapids are entertaining while counterattacking. I just want to say, me taking over for Andrew, like what I'm here to do. That's what I want to bring to this team. I just wanted my opening press conference <laughs> to have that on record so that I can match every other coach in the world. That was an, an a dramatic one on Friday night. A great weekend of action. We'll go through most of these games as well, but let's jump to Sunday because it all ended. Kind of on a high, at least intensity-wise. New York, New York. You get the rivalry game. Good atmosphere. I was in the building for this one. We'll talk about the second goal and how it came about. But first, Bobby, you were really entertained with the fact that NYCFC came out with a game plan, seemed to control things in the first half, and the New York Red Bulls flipped things in the second half, and these two coaches kind of going toe-to-toe with their philosophies and yeah, their system. And NYCFC smashed them in the first half. Is there any, any other way to put it? And then Red Bulls come back. They dominate the second half. They get the goal, which we'll talk about, to win. But I wasn't sure why. I had no idea. Did you know why in the middle of the game what would have changed? I, it looked to me like they pushed, like Armas pushed the fullbacks up a little bit higher to almost mad mark the the two wingbacks. And if, I think that happened at about the 35-minute mark, not, not even at halftime. And like once you take away those long diagonals mm-hmm. to – to the to the wingbacks for NYCFC, they don't really have any other ideas, or they didn't yesterday. I think if Tajiri Shradi or, or Matriza were there, maybe they would have. And then it, it led to the first goal, or well, to the, to the penalty. It was a turnover from Madarita, um, and, and Dome was, I think, justifiably steamed at that. So I thought it was a good adjustment from Chris Armas. So so here was my takeaway, and I had to watch Chris Armas's press conference and then go back and rewatch the game to take this away. I'm going to read the Chris Armas quote. On goal kicks, and this is my own quote, remember that they hit Sean Johnson almost every ball long in the first half. Every goal kick 
Almost every single one. Yeah. He, he pounded straight at midfield. He had Ibiaga wide open in mm-hmm. the opening five minutes, and he kept waving him off, and Ibiaga didn't understand right. because they're so used to playing it short, and he finally moved up, and then he hits it long. So here is the Armist quote. On goal kicks, they are putting guys 10 or 15 yards offside into your half, meaning our half. It takes your, it makes your back line uncomfortable. It forces you into a little bit of a passive mode. So then they were setting our line instead of us setting our line, and we are at our best when we can compress space and be aggressive. We weren't as aggressive at stepping out at, out of the back line. They were parking three guys centrally, and this makes it difficult. And he's right. When they were pounding those balls forward, they might not. Or NYCFC might not have won the first one, but they won the second or the third because Red Bulls were stretched. Part of the reason NYCFC were playing it long is that Red Bulls set their line of confrontation all the way up at the top of NYCFC's box. They were initiating their press from the very beginning, forcing, essentially, NYC to play it long. And why Red Bulls did that, I'm not sure. It only took NYCFC, like, six years to realize. (laughs) Well, They did it last year at Yankee Stadium in Bill May's first game. You guys remember that? Yeah, the one they finished with nine players. Yeah, it was 1-1, I think. It was also Armas' first game. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was, like, Dome's third game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's why NYCFC dominate the first game. Red Bulls get stretched. NYCFC plays it long. They pick up second and third balls and all of a sudden can play in the middle half and the attacking half. We come out of halftime. Red Bulls drop their line. They keep their center backs farther back because you can't just leave Eber and Maxi Morales behind your defenders. You have to keep that line there. They drop their three strikers 20 yards to stay more compact. It did the two things. One, it kept them tighter for second balls. But two, it coerced or what's the right, right, right word or Matt? I don't know where you're going. It coerced, <laughs> it coerced NYCFC. Jabberwocky. It jabberwockied NYCFC to play out of the back. Once NYCFC played out of the back, then Red Bulls pressed, and they could press from a compact starting point. And we found over the years that if the Red Bulls can press you from a compact starting point in your own half, they will beat you. They make the game chaotic. They make the game about second balls. They make you uncomfortable. And when they do that, you are in big trouble. And that's why they dominated the second half. And you, I can in- tell you. Induced. Induced. Yes. That doesn't feel right. Okay. I can tell you from being there, though, there seems to be a, a nice love relationship between Chris Armas and Dome Torrent. And when you talk about the way they came out, I think Chris Armas was complimentary post game, as was Dome. It was probably the only thing Dome was com- complimentary about after this game, about the way Chris set up his team and vice versa. They got in a nice little hug after the game. They both complained about the referees. So there's something common for everyone to bond over, which is at times, being frustrated with officiating because the second goal in this game, Daniel Royer scores both. Uh, NYCFC takes a 1-0 lead basically on their first attack in the first half, and then New York gets a penalty kick to close out the first half in stoppage time. And then Daniel Royer gets the game-winning goal, Doyle, in the 60 or so minute. It comes off a quick throw-in taken by... Are you going to me? You're the one who's there. Yeah. But... All right, let me set it up for you. Uh, the Red Bulls get the second goal off a quick throw in David what else happened because you were the you were the eyes on the ground for us um hey, what great setup Matt great setup. <sighs> thank you guys what happened what, I felt like I was going in a better place what happened was Alex Cowan I'm the host now put the ball out <laughs> I am the host now he put the ball out of play god it's really hard to work through some of these moments <laughs> and the linesman pointed directly to the corner right in front of him and said it was out for mm-hmm. a corner Alex wheeled. wait can you run that back one more time yeah what was that last part you just said he pointed Directly to the corner. Okay. Because he was standing right there because he said it was a corner. And by the way, way, Corey Rockwell, like well-known, has has refed in World Cups, Mm -hmm. I believe. I I think he did the final of a a couple Gold Cups. Yeah. Okay. He's well-regarded. The well-regarded assistant referee is in good position, makes a call. That's the other part to say. Who's the host? It's his his side, right? right? Because a linesman could be on the opposite side. This is now a Bakuninist podcast. There there are no distinctions. I'm turning. I'm turning. I'm just making sure I'm following along Now the game's a little chaotic. And Alan Kelly, Carlos, can you turn off Bobby's ref of the year, was the center. And so the ball goes out right there, and the the assistant referee points to the corner flag for a solid two or three full seconds. Okay. And apparently Alex Callens asked, is it a corner? And he said, yeah. Alex Callens turns away to walk back to the goal. Jog back. Jog back. J- mm, slowly <laughs> jog back. Uh, a light. It's a jaunt. Okay. Meander. Uh, I think it might be a soft. I think it might be jogging. <laughs> and uh, Alex Wheel hears that it's actually a throw-in, takes it quickly. New York off that quick throw-in, knocks the ball around once or twice, plays a quick corner, uh, plays a quick cross in. Daniel Royer. Not a quick heads corner. It. Hold on. No, no. T- sorry, quick. takes a quick cross in. Quick cross. Daniel Royal heads it to the far post. NYCFC is furious. 
because they're going back to set up for a corner kick because they were told it was a corner kick and the center referee overruled the assistant referee and said it was a throw in and New York was quick off that. Ah, I want to say you you dealt uh, with that really well. We made you. the game well uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And you dealt with it. Nice job. Listen, as a professional, I feel like I need to react to whatever situation does occur, Woo! whether it's correct or not. Wow. Kalen, how do you feel about how this all turned out? Because Dome said after the game, we made mistakes in the game, absolutely, but our team played well. The referee lost this game for us. And he went up to the referee, told him that after, said it in the post-game press conference as well, in whatever words he chose to use, that the referee mistake was what lost this game for NYCFC. Yeah, I agree. I think it was uh, the, the margin between these two teams is so small, and I said this last night on the show, but that a, a single play can change the game. And there is a responsibility on the players. There's a responsibility on the managers. And in my ca- in my opinion, there is also a responsibility on the referees. I don't think Alan Kelly handled this well. I think he should have trusted his assistant referee there, Rockwell, who was in good position, who made a very clear and decisive point to where he thought the ball should be. He was in the right position. All he has to do is understand did it go over my right shoulder or over my left shoulder? It went over his right shoulder. He points for the, uh, for the uh, corner kick. NYCFC at that point, this is choreography. This, th- this is not in soccer. There are a lot of fluid moments, but a set piece and a corner kick, Callens has a specific responsibility at that point where he needs to go, and he, he's either on a, man, a specific man where he's man marking, or he's on the six, or he's on the post. In his case, as one of the larger players on the team, center back, he's likely man marking or in or in a zone spot. So at this point, these guys have to go flip right into this because they can't tune out because this is their jobs. This is the, this, the margins are tight here. And you know Red Bull likes to take it quick, whether it's a corner or whether it's a throw in. But in this case, they go expecting one thing. They're told one thing. The other thing happens. Boom, it's in the goal. I think it was decisive. So, yes, I understand why Sean Johnson is furious. I understand why Dome Torrent is furious. I understand why NYCFC feels hard done here because you're told one thing and something else happens entirely differently. Does anyone else have anything else? I mean, obviously they couldn't possibly have scored an equalizer with 30 minutes left. Sure, but... Sure, yeah. Or you could but th- take the corner. That didn't happen. You could take the corner quickly. Trent Alexander-Arnold showed that one a few months ago. Yeah, Barcelona. and whether it's, I mean, I, I agree with you. I would be furious as well if I was an NYCFC player. And it. I, I understand what Alan Kelly has said. And, like, technically he's correct. If the center ref decides it's a throw-in, it's a throw-in. The center ref decides everything, by the way. Right. That needs to be clear. The, but, the, uh, the AR puts their flag up. The center ref then agrees. That's how every out-of-bounds. But there's no, like, if you're Maxime Cheneau, you cannot let Royer get that position on you. I don't care if you think, and it, this didn't happen three second, you know, a second and a half after he took the throw in. There were a couple of passes. There was movement in the box. The game was obviously going on, and Chanel did switch off. So I think two things can be true. Th- that said, what you said is more true than the point that <laughs> I made. Let me continue with it a little bit yeah. because in this case, if you are going to not take the recommendation of the assistant referee, and this let, let's also rewind the tape and say that this was not a a, a moment of indecision from Rockwell. There wasn't right. a moment where yeah. he's kind of looking up and kind of points to the center to say, I, I'm unsure of right. my decision. He made a very clear and obvious point <laughs> to, the, to the corner flag, that it was going to be a corner. Alan Kelly, Kelly came out afterwards and said that he gave a vocal... Mm-hmm. Uh, indication of it being a throw-in. That's not good enough. That That's not good enough in that situation because nobody is going to be able to hear. I don't know if you tell a phone a friend what, right. what you're doing. No one's going to be able to hear that. In front right? of the supporter if, section. If Alan Kelly, who may or may not have had a better angle, truly felt that it was a throw-in, if he feels like he saw it and he is the final say and he saw that it went out for a throw-in, then what is he supposed to do? Because that sounds like what happened here. When he talked to the pool reporter after the game, he said, I thought I knew what I saw. I saw a throw and These weren't his exact words, so right. excuse me. But he essentially said, I made the call that it was a throw and What is he supposed he to do? He can pause play. It has to be no, decided. He can't. He's yeah. not going to pause play. He makes the call. Well, listen, if Alex Wheel had taken a corner kick, he would have stopped play and said, no, it's a throw in. 
right? But he didn't. He called a throw in. It was it, the throw. This is awkward. Nobody wants this to happen. The same way you don't want to see a goal scored after the ball hits a referee or somebody score while a player is down and they play through it. But nothing went wrong here. Nothing bad happened. It was just unfortunate and awkward. Well, I, I disagree with that because I, I think we've, you know, the criticism levied at NYCFC is that they switched off, mm-hmm. right? Is that not the criticism here? Yes. To me, they didn't switch off. They're immediately going to go defend a corner kick at right. that moment in time. So they're continuing to play. New York Red Bull surely didn't switch off. We know that they never do. That's what they do on set pieces. That's why they win games. That's why they win moments like this. And Alex Mouille, he doesn't even, I don't know if he even realizes what the referee's call is. He's just going, get me the ball. Like he's motioning, give me the ball immediately to take the quick throw. And so neither of the teams. I think, it, I think he may have known because the AR may have said it. Okay. Because he was right there. Either and, way. And you see the AR pulls his flag back right before. Either, either way. It. Muil did not switch off in this point. To me, the ref, the center referee is switched off in this moment because I think he's watching the game. And at that point, it happens quickly, but that's when you need, and a big match official has to take control of that moment. He has to be able to say, this is a corner kick, and I'm going to blow the whistle to stop this play mm-hmm. because this is what my assistant referee has done, and I trust his decision, his positioning here. He was very decisive in it, and I'm going to blow the whistle and take it back there. Or you have to make a very clear and obvious choice to say that that's not the decision, and I'm going to let everybody on the field know in that moment that this is a throw-in. I'm reverse, I'm not taking that suggestion of a call, and I'm taking this one instead. So, so. here are the quick three answers from the, to the pool reporter from the officials at the game. The referee overruled the AR because the referee was in a better position to judge that the ball went out for a throw-in, then followed up asking, did they make a throw-in motion? He said no. No throw in motion was made and would not normally be made. And then the final question was, was it reviewed by VAR? Was it indicated to NYCFC? And it said the referee indicated verbally that the restart was a throw in. Corner kick first throw in decisions are not reviewable by the VAR. Right. So not letting apparently told I, I'm not gonna let Maxime Cheneau off the hook here. I just watched the this this goal. 15 times. Maxime Cheneau is watching the whole thing happen. He sees the throw in. In fact, I'm looking at it. NYCFC have five defenders in the box to only two attackers for the Red Bulls. I understand that this is a scripted play, that this is not a fluid moment. They still outnumbered the Red Bulls two to one in the box, and they just let Royer have an open header. It had to be better from from them. It had to be better from Alan Kelly as well. It had to be better from Corey Rockwell. It had to be better from NYC. I thought Corey did a good job. He pointed. He, I think he did his job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think this falls only on the center referee. From uh, my opinion. Daniel Royer, two goals, gets the victory, two one in this, the first of the Hudson River Derbies of 2019, 2020. There'll be a trophy that they get to lift as the fans are starting their own setup, similar to Cascadia Cup, similar to what we see with the Supporters Shield between the two Hudson River Derby uh, supporters groups, except, excuse me, three of them, Viking Army, ESC, and Third Rail. NYCFC currently second in the Eastern Conference on points per game. New York Red Bulls right behind them on third. Plenty of games in hand. When you look over back to the Western Conference, a little bit of... Not controversy, but pure drama. Minnesota knocking off FC Dallas. Mason Toy, his fourth goal of the year, all basically coming in the last month or so, and then Open Cup goals on top of that for him. Gets the goal in the 91st minute to look like win it. Then Vito Minone does everything himself. <laughs> he fouls. It was a Thomas Roberts? Brian, or Brian Reynolds. Reynolds. Brian Sorry. Reynolds, yeah. uh, Fra- Fra- that was a very Andrew, Andrew Weeby mo- yeah. moment. Maybe it's this chair. <laughs> Maybe that's what it does with FC Dallas Academy kids. Fouls him himself to give up a penalty kick in the 94th minute and then saves it in the 97th minute. Adrian Heath's going wild, hugging. Minnesota United are fourth in the Western Conference right now. Fifth best record in all of Major League Soccer. Are you paying attention, Matt Doyle? Yeah, absolutely. This team, like going into the Gold Cup break, and then that first half against Houston in the U.S. Open Cup, this was it. Like this was, they were about to have a, a failed season. They had lost something like four or five games. They were down two nil at the half, and then they came out at halftime of that Open Cup game, hung three on on the Dynamo. It was Darwin Quintero. Just something clicked with him, and Toy got the game winner in that one. And ever since that game, they they've been winning. They they've been going out there, and they you know it's. It, it's not always pretty. It's sometimes tough to figure out exactly what they're doing. A lot of it is about 
getting the ball up to Angelo and letting him manhandle defenders, which he's superb at. Um, and they wear you out, and then you have Guy in Toy, who is just uh, in the box right now. He's finding gaps. Um, and it's almost like the way he's doing it is like Wando style. Those two goals that he had against Minnesota, he wasn't getting in front of his men. He wasn't, you know, getting to the near post. This was, okay, they're drawn towards the ball a little bit. I'm going to back up. I'm going to find the space behind him. Back post finish. This one was just on your toes, awake for the rebound, get there before the defender. It's it's huge. It's been the best month in Minnesota United history. But I was paying attention last July as well when I believe they went 5-0-0 or maybe 4-1-0. And the one and, before that. Yeah. So they have a month like this every year. Uh, like this every so year. in your expert analysis. They're a much more talented team. I trust Ike. I worry about the fact that it looks like Ozzy Alonso might have broken his collarbone in this one. That would be a huge issue for this team. One of the things that's not right now is the play of Mason Toy, Bobby. He has played phenomenal. Doyle just talked about some of the things he does well. You sat with him at Combine the yeah. year he got drafted out of Indiana University. Just 19 mm-hmm. years old. Just a freshman out of college. And, okay, it took him a year or a little more to figure out his feet. It happens to some players mm-hmm. in the world. What did you take away from who he is, though, and what maybe has allowed him to find the success? Watching his games in college and then to get ready for the combine, then watching the combine, now watching a few of his professional games, his ceiling is very high. And we talk about guys like Corey Baird or Jonathan Lewis or Jeremy Bobasi, these players who get some minutes in Major League Soccer and do okay. It feels to me like Mason Toy's potential, his ceiling is higher than all of them. The way he glides on the ball, his confidence, his reading of space, his general touch. He's still very inconsistent, obviously, but my main takeaway, David, is that he might have the highest potential of every under, he's 19 right now. What? He's every yeah, 21 or under U.S. player, U.S. You attacker. You can say 22 under 22. Sure, right? Of these guys Shout who are just trying well. to break through in Major League Soccer. So that's my main takeaway. Every skill he has or every little attribute he has is very high level except the basics. And if you can figure out the basics and pair them with, with the ability to glide on the ball, his control, his touch, his, his ability to find angles toward goal – then we're talking about a player that probably raises the bar on the other options that are in the U.S. player pool right now. The interesting thing about him is he, he's very upfront about his improvement, and he says it's because I didn't work hard enough in training last year. I'm working harder and coming to training every day, uh, working smarter and, and understanding what I need to improve on. So there's a good message to you if you're a young actually, player in this league and not getting minutes, uh, go to practice and earn them. He actually moved closer to the training ground yeah. in the off season so that he could be closer and do more work. He also got time with forward Madison, right? A, a couple more minutes under his belt. I he be- wasn't great with forward Madison. It's well, weird. This it's- is going to be a really weird thing about USL, by the way, where if teams expect, because Bobasi wasn't great with Portland, Jonathan too. Jonathan Lewis wasn't Jonathan, great right. when he went to Lou City. There's just something weird about stepping down and playing well and killing. We both played in the old reserve games, how hard it is and how, how much players struggled at times. So it'll be weird to see that development. I know this is off topic, David. No, no, I apologize. It's but to see the way teams use their USL programs to prepare for the first team when you see these players doing better for the first team than the USL team. Um, one, two, three people at this desk. I would call all of you experts. Adrian Heath might as well, which means there's a free ticket for one of you to a Minnesota United game if you want to go. I've been. I've been. <laughs> I went to a game. I've, I don't, he's, he can't be talking about me. Oh, you think you're not on I've this? been. I've been to Minnesota. I, I've, I just was out there. Yeah. You don't think you caught a stray on this one? You think I you honestly feel it? like this was probably more directed towards Andrew Weeby. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely Weeby. Weeby, uh, right? Yeah. I think. What, what are we talking about? Or, 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 oh, so Weeby's after this there. game, Adrian Heath, a couple comments, I think. I think he has something in his contract where every time they win a certain amount of games in a row, he has to attack someone <laughs> that works for MajorLeagueSoccer.com. Did he attack Bobby? Uh, he, he said I think there it was Susanna, though. He I'm said there right. were th- at least three experts. He said no one's watching us, no one's paying attention. He feels like teams that have worse records or are playing worse than them keep be putting it's the power them rankings on those. Everybody power gets rankings. sucked yep. into this freaking fish hook of a of oh, a man, dude. of a power rankings. Did it it, it that- like. Kills coaches and <laughs> and everybody is just did you read can't that? deal with it. Did you read it as a player? Now that yeah. you're not a player, I anymore? still don't read it. <laughs> you think that it's maybe that you don't take them seriously enough? <laughs> 
Like, it, honestly, if you don't wake up every Tuesday and determine your value as a human yeah. being <laughs> based upon the MLSsoccer.com power rankings, I don't even know what kind of life you're living, Kalen. Right. So I think right now we're looking yeah. at Adrian Heath calling out three experts. So we've got Andrew Wiebe. Obviously, Ben Bear is one of them. I think mm. that that's, that's been made evident itself. No, what did he say? Uh, I don't have the exact quote in front of me. It basically said we keep getting overlooked for teams that aren't as good. Maybe we should buy them a ticket and have them find out where Minnesota is and then pause and said, but all, I do know that there are at least three experts at MLSsoccer.com. No, no, just no, MLS.com. No, MLS. MLS.com. Sorry, sorry. I forgot he was looking for real estate as well on that one. Um, <laughs> I don't like that. So there's no way you're one of them. So we're just going to try and figure out who the third one is. Maybe we'll do a little bit of a uh, research here. Uh, maybe an interview. I don't, I don't like the fact that he, by implication, <laughs> called Bobby Warshaw an expert. I know. It's insane, isn't Ooh, it? Because I will insane. say this for Bobby. He can watch and diagnose a game. His conclusions, often faulty. And there's the curveball of the day. Didn't realize Adrian Heath <laughs> knocking Bobby would turn into Doyle trying to knock Bobby as well. It's been a good day for you. But I think I think Adrian's got a point. Whatever tries to tear you down only makes you stronger. That's what everyone says. That's what the Seattle Sounders will be saying. It's so wait, a, we're just moving on from that? Yeah, I'm done with it. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Jack, you don't, you don't respect Minnesota <laughs> at all. <laughs> Chris Clute. What? Okay. I don't know what's happening now. Right. That just got way out of control for me. Uh, Seattle Sounders knock off Atlanta United uh, at home on Sunday before the New York Derby on national TV as well. Two of the biggest clubs in the league. We talked about what they've done for this league in their time coming in, the way they've changed the perception, the way they've changed the way clubs act. On the field, though, for Seattle Sounders, they've been missing a lot of their stars because of international duty, because of injuries. Almost as close to a full lineup as they can have. No um, Ariega in this one, but Kim Kihi back to start at center back. For the Seattle Sounders, when you look at this team, the way they played in this game against a top opponent, is this a blueprint for who the Sounders are going to be for the next two or three months of this season? You're referring to the fact that it wasn't a particularly pretty game. But they won. That's they what I was referring to. Right, yeah, that this is probably, if you look at where the Sounders are in the hierarchy of the Western Conference, LAFC, Portland, San Jose, the way Dallas are playing, even though they're dropping points, maybe the new RSL, especially if Severino and Rusnak are balling out, the, yeah, maybe Seattle can't manhandle teams with their personnel anymore. Maybe they can't just out-soccer, out-possess, out-kill you know, kill you in the channels and, and create opportunities, that they have to have another it. And in this game, it felt like the it, was the fact that they just outworked and won duels and, and made an intense game, and they won that intensity battle. Also, Raul Ruiz scored maybe the goal of the year, or are we not oh, ready to on. give that That's a great goal? What's, so I'm not What's call better? It goal name, of the year. name one better it's, right now. It's a, it's a good goal. It's not a goal of the year. Oh, God. You're that Bob, guy that uses Golazo every other every No, other no, no, no. It's not a goal. I still it's think, a goal. I think my favorite goal of the year so far is still the Pontius one uh, for L.A., Way back near the the start of the season, just because the buildup was so great, oh, it was God. like a twenty five pass buildup. Yeah. You're talking about the finish uh, of the year. Also, the last time they did a buildup. Uh, Whoa! Also true. I remember. I'm remembering like Rodriguez's goal off the corner kick, the direct left footed mm. volley from yeah. DC. What yeah, about what about Pasuelo going full field with the double mm. step overs? Puts one in the corner. Chip. Okay. Oh, what about Rooney's seventy five yard? But goal yeah. of the year, maybe goal Depends of the year. Into. Maybe goal <laughs> of the year. Yeah. You guys have already knocked that uh, one down. Can, can I just say this about Seattle, like? They did the left side overload again this one mm -hmm. because they have Smith healthy and they had, you know, the, the Ladero back. And when he's back and Rodan and Gustav Svensson are back behind him, he really does get more free reign and can go anywhere without any inhibition at all. Um, and, and like nobody's really been able to stop that when they've been mostly healthy this year. So the Sounders are just going to keep doing it, and that's been Brian Schmetzer's M.O. as a head coach. You know, put out the same formation every game, sometimes switch to a 4-4-2 if you need to chase a goal, but it's a 4-2-3-1, get the ball at the feet of your best player, mm -hmm. overload that left side, and go to work, and there's, there's nothing wrong with it. I do think that they need a talent upgrade on one of the wings mm -hmm. in order to— Is Rodriguez not that guy when healthy? When healthy. Okay. He's he hasn't been healthy, and like even so, I don't think he's one of the very best in the league at that spot. I think he's very good. Yeah. I would I would have said the town upgrade needs to come central. That yeah, you don't think it, if they were to play a Portland or an LAFC right now against Chara and Paredes or K and Atuesta that you wouldn't be concerned about the four of Svensson and Torres or Svensson and Ariaga, Svensson and Roldan. Did you watch this game against Atlanta? <laughs> 
Svensson, I Roldan, think, and Ladero just completely bossed Atlanta United center midfield. Although and that's where they won the game. Although if they do upgrade at central midfield, Roldan could be then an upgrade on the wing if you move him out there. I, I think he's better in the middle. I don't like this idea with Roldan as a winger with the national team or for club. I, I know he's a talented guy that can play a couple of positions, but his strength is in the middle, covering ground, winning tackles, and then ushering the ball to Ladero in the wings, getting Jordan Morris involved. Uh, I, I think this Seattle team, they win the games of margins always. If you if you listen to Schmetzer post game, he he goes through these this little list of these metrics that he looks at, and a lot of them are uh, duels won is a, is a big one that he looks at. Um, I saw I saw Seattle win that one for sure against Atlanta United, mm-hmm. and, and and then also just trying to see. Um, how how they get the ball moving forward, and then look, they have a couple of really special players. Ladero is one of the best players in the league, and then we saw what Rui Diaz can do. Jordan Morris, I still think there's more for him uh, in the second half of the season. He had sort of a disjointed beginning. They started really strong, and had a little bit of an injury knock, I believe. Was he out for a little bit? Mm-hmm. He was, and then with the national team. So I, I think he can take a step forward. Um, in the second half of the year. But I, I really believe in the Seattle team. I think they're the second best team in the West. Summer transfer window is open and the rumors will abound. Right now, the name is Sebastian Cristofo, a Uruguayan central midfielder from Fiorentina who has been linked to the Seattle Sounders. We do know one thing, whether it's for this year or later, Garth Lagerway has brought in younger DPs to sit behind more experienced players a year early to get them ready for what could be taking over for Svensson. Going forward, we shall see. I do not know what's going on there. Let's move on to something a little less happy. First, we'll start with PT Martinez. Last week, he gave an interview on Fox Radio in Argentina in which he said, in so many words, he'd rather be playing at River Plate right now than Atlanta United, but... It won't happen, so it doesn't matter. He then met with Carlos Bocanegra and met with Frank DeBoer after that, and everything seems to be good and happy again. And that's always true when people say that, especially in <laughs> the media. Definitely doesn't seem to be good or happy. <laughs> no. Well, Atlanta United, you're not supposed to go on the road to Seattle from Atlanta and win a game. That's not an expectation. Atlanta United is also not supposed to, not supposed to be 3-5-1 and one in their last nine games. Um, it, they, they keep looking so stagnant, trying to build, like anytime they had an opportunity to counterattack, especially into that space um, that that Brad Smith leaves on the overlap, they just lack the dynamism and lack the uh, ability to play quickly through the lines or into the channels um, that you need to to hit that. Uh, The body language is bad. Even Joseph, after he scored, Looked furious and like not in the way that Joseph always <laughs> kinds of look. Yeah, you know, like, like he looked like like legitimately angry still at his team. Um, did you read his lips? <laughs> I did not. Some... What do you say, Callan? What do you say? Uh, you can't say it. You can't say it. On we don't work blue yeah. on this show. This is a family show. Yeah. Uh, Leandro Gonzalez Perez. I like he. Phew. And so much of what happened in the first two three months of the season. We were talking about how great Miles Robinson was because he was putting out fire after fire after fire, and he's taking a step back. He's still good, but like he wasn't a he's a rookie basically. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be able to play at that level the entire season. So I don't know that recovery on a Harry Ship was pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean Harry Ship left that door open. <laughs> Harry <laughs> Ship <laughs> is one of the one yeah, of the places that said it, it stuff. It depends yeah. on which way you look at it, but I, I'm still impressed with Robinson. I, I, think. I am too. I'm not Hashtag saying he's bad, but like he was otherworldly for the first two three months of the yeah. season. He really was, and he hasn't been the past month. He got really Diaz. Yeah, uh, Atlanta United. There's been question marks all season. We will continue to talk about this. Wait, one. Wait, let me ask you: Do you think they are any better now than they no. were in say? Mid-April. I'm going to tell you right now, no, but I won't tell you why because we're going to move on because I'm in the Andrew Weeby seat. And we'll talk about it on Thursday. They're worse, Matt. They're in a worse position. It felt like in April at least. Oh, my God, Bobby. Something. Be on my team. Uh, I thought worse. we were a midfield no, I want to, all right, so, this. So I want to hear why, Bobby. Are we allowed to do this, David? Yeah, you can do this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm leaving. <laughs> well, well, because at least then they're really good at something. And if you're really good at something, you can build into other things. They're really good at keeping possession. Specifically, when you're good at keeping possession – the next step is turning that possession into goals. And if you would ask me, were, they, were P.T. Martinez and Vialba and Joseph and all these guys going to turn possession to goals? The answer is undoubtedly yes. 
but now they're not even good at possession. The, the it that they had, their competitive advantage, with which both aligned their defense and made it seem like they were going to start scoring goals, is now gone. So they're not actually above average in anything right now. And I, I will add that the last three games, the sample size has been hard. You get the weird red card at Chicago, and then you play the really good game against, or the really competitive game against Red Bulls, and then at Seattle is a hard game, right? So I don't think this is like a panic button stretch, but it is concerning that, that they're no longer actually that good at any part of the game. What? What? Because you, you love to play the percentages. What percentage do you put of them missing the playoffs? Oh, under 5%. Okay. Boom, there you go. Atlanta United, lock it in. Wait, I have- wait, what if they lose to Houston on Wednesday at home? Same. Yeah, it'd be concerning. I mean, these next two games, home against Houston, home against D.C., you would expect them to show their dominance again. Four of the next five are at home. That game coming up next week, D.C. on Matt, Sunday, what do you national think, TV. What do you think of Michael Parker? Really trying to that? host this show right now. It's really been fun. Uh, let's move on for a moment. I have some homework for Chicago Fire fans, FC Cincinnati, Colorado Rapids. We're going to talk about your teams a lot more on Thursday. So what do you think? What do you think about what's going on? Orlando as well. And we should have Chris Mueller on the show. So pressure on there for Chris Mueller because now you're being challenged to come on the show forever, forever forward. forward. Me and Doyle, we're on the same page right now. Um, A few last comments from this weekend. Portland Timbers draw 2-2 with the Colorado Rapids. Thoughts and prayers from everyone on this show go out to Gio Savarese and his family. His father passed away just before that game. A really nice moment, the whole team, after the first goal, coming over to celebrate with their coach. He's been obviously right into that community. It's a special connection to see between Savarese and Portland Timbers, and so you know that they'll be helping him get through these tough moments. And then uh, congratulations to Tim Milia. He is currently the all-time wins leader in Sporting KC history, former MLS pool goalkeeper. And now he is the man, names like Kevin Hartman, Tony Miola, Jimmy Nielsen, pretty good goalkeepers. You know, he, had st- he had taken a step back, I think, this year, but the last month or so, he started to started to look again like the guy he was from 2015 to 2018, where I think for probably that four season stretch he was the best keeper in the league. What percentage do you guys have of oh, SKC God. making the playoffs? Feels like about 15 percent. I don't I don't do percentages. It's not my game. If you so were I feel to- nothing. Kalen's up. Kalen's up. Kalen doesn't even use numbers. Yeah. Numbers are. It's a power rankings thing. Yeah. It's <laughs> a power rankings thing. But I mean, look at it. We have eighth place is Houston, ninth place is Sporting, tenth place is Portland. Like, Portland's uh, in. Portland's in. So then seventh place is Dallas, sixth is RSL, fifth is the Quicks, fourth is Minnesota. I'm not going to go up to the Galaxy and third. The Galaxy are in, right? I don't know. Like, how many of those teams do we think are legitimately going to drop? Of those teams you just said, I could see the Galaxy being one of them. That would surprise me. There you go. Galaxy has some cushion. Well, I'm here to surprise you. Dallas, That's what might I be, Dallas might be in trouble. Dallas might be in trouble. They've been slowly moving down the rankings, or the standings, mainly because they had uh, played the most games by far. Um, last shout-out goes to Club America, the Campione de Campion. Mm. Is that the correct term right there? Mm-hmm. To play in the Campiones Cup, coming up on August 14th in Atlanta, the big one, the second ever Campiones Cup. Bobby loves the Campiones Cup. Big He's Campiones all Cup, yeah. in uh, on the Campiones is, Cup. Is Gio Dos Santos going to break our hearts? I and hope so. I feel like he's going to come back to MLS <laughs> oh my God, the way Jonah did amazing. against the men's national team. Well, so they won this Campiones, <laughs> the Campiones Cup at Dignity Sporting Health Park. Did I say that correctly? No. Okay. Dignity. Okay. No, go do it. No, no, just please, on. please do it. No, now I'm nervous about it. Okay, no, <laughs> I just didn't know can't. what you said was wrong. <laughs> Which is, of course, the LA Galaxy's home field. So Gio Dos Santos, his life still, you know, going up. Uh, there's rumors Inter Miami might be about to close on two teenage DPs. We'll talk about that in team building coming up a little bit later. It sounds like Portland's making some small moves here and there. And then some rumors for the Columbus crew as they continue to try and add to what they've built so far under Tim Bezbachenko and Caleb Porter. Which is another thing that I think we're going to talk about on Thursday because... It has not gone super well, Uh, but let's get to the mailbag. Let's start out with a disgruntled but optimistic fan from NYCFC. Let's call them Polina (laughs) Gutelov. And they said, at Gassman, curious about your thoughts on backup keepers. I've been watching Stuver for over a season now with NYC, and I'm genuinely curious why Caldwell never got a chance. Personally, I'd love to see someone like Marcinkowski or Tarbell where Johnson backup, but that's probably San Jose's bias creeping in. Who are your top backup goalkeepers in Major League Soccer? We're taking a mailbag question on backup goalkeepers yep. right now. This is the this is the backup catcher conversation. I, I think 
the only one that feels like an argument right now is maybe LAFC because Cisniega was so good when Tyler Miller was with the U.S. national team. Except for that goal against Vancouver, which was awful. That's fair. But I don't think that's even an argument. I, I don't know. I thought Brad Stuber was fine. Yeah. And Bobby, what's your feelings on backup goalkeepers? I love backup goalkeepers. I think they're extremely important to a team in a locker room. I just don't know how they make extra time driven by Continental. Okay. Good guys to party with. Are they? Pretty reliably the mm-hmm. best dude to party with is a backup goalkeeper. <laughs> because they know that they don't have to play? Yeah, it's a personality thing. And then they always stay in the training field the longest the next day. They're always the last one out there taking shots. Great yeah. dudes. Okay, great dudes. We uh, Who's the backup <laughs> Today goalkeeper? Today I learned, man. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Who's the backup goalkeeper of our community? Ooh, it's a really good I think, I think Rich. Yeah. yeah. You think Rich? Yeah, yeah. Rich. it's I'll definitely <laughs> Rich. It's definitely Rich. Nice. <laughs> Happy birthday to Rich Hernandez as well. He has no gallbladder. Blue America fan. Oh, yeah. wait, no, he's Cruz Azul. <laughs> he's a Pachuca fan. Okay. Uh, Alfredo here just wants to send in two thoughts. First one is, had to buy new tires this week. There's only one brand that sponsors MLS and Extra Time. Wow. So I obviously bought a set of Continental tires. Let me hear you. Let me hear you. <laughs> I feel like Josie Altador right now. He also said, obviously, New York is red, and this email came from Red Bull Arena. The follow-up question from someone else was, why does Keaton Parks have Keaton on his jersey? He uh, went to Portugal and went native. It's it's the mix effect. I, I feel like Mick, once Mix did it, it was just yeah. trickled down. You was, have, he set the precedent. Would you do Kalen now? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> Come on. I, it was already weird enough I wore number three. As a, yeah, that was strange. Well, I mean, you can't spot, you should have been a fullback. <laughs> you should have been a left back. Should have been a left back. Uh, David from Macon, Georgia here. He says, question for the next show. MLS used to be seen as a stereotypically physical league with maybe lower skill, with the rising caliber of players and teams, how would you describe the current state of MLS physicality? Oh, sorry, that's Ben in Beaverton. That's a really good question. That's what we're here for. That's why the fans are here. I I I never understood the knock against physicality. Mm. All the best leagues in the world are physical. Yeah. (laughs) I I think the people who who considered MLS to be an overly physical league had never watched, like, Copa Libertadores, Uh, like the Brazilian Serie A. Like, that's... There are crimes committed on those fields. I would just think the rankings of physicality leagues, Premier League 1, Brazil 2, I don't know where Argentina ranks on this, but lower than, what would would be next? France? Are we talking physicality in terms of just like the, the, because it's, the well, speed and intensity the speed of the and game. and intensity of the game, yeah. Those Not like bo- what referees allow to be played. Yeah, I think Germany is probably number three. Germany is number three, but below yeah. MLS would be Liga MX. Would be Italy, mm-hmm. would be Spain. Yeah. Um, so it's not just but, back to Kalen's games, point. There's also less uniformity in leagues than there used to be. True. But just to go to Kalen's point, I never thought of it as a knock or not a knock. I personally prefer physicality in leagues. I prefer pace and intensity and all those things. Like the top three or four leagues are the ones that I like to watch. It's like the first thing people say when they say the Premier League's the best in the world. I think. Look, everyone's so strong and fast. Yeah, I, I, the indictment is on the skill, right? That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's all there is. That there the, was no the, okay. Right. And that's, that's what the people have said. Like, all along, like, oh, MLS coaches only prefer big, strong, physical players rather than, you know, tiny, skillful. We would never have a, a Xavi or an Iniesta here. I, I mean, in cert, for certain teams, that was obviously very true. For it's other also teams, true for, like, 99% of clubs around the world. Yeah, but for other teams, it's obviously very not. And one of the things to consider is that over the years, the classic sit in central midfield number 10 has kind of died out around the world. But it hasn't in MLS. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's the type of player I like to watch, so I enjoy it. But it, it's something to consider when people are throwing sort of blanket observations. Who are those players? Uh, well, now Pozuela would be uh, a big one for sure. Kaku is one. Maxi Morales? Uh, Maxi Morales uh, as well. And now Maxi Morales and Kaku are... I think a little bit more mobile mm-hmm. in certain ways. Also, is a good shout in this. People, um, people would have been one. People would have been one. Is. Valeri, the Valeri, more of a second forward the mm-hmm. last three years. Uh, even Ladero. I mean, Ladero didn't really make it with Ajax because he needed to be that guy. And I think in Seattle, he, but he he's covers been ground as a he does. He's done. He's a more modern version. Um, Mauro Diaz was probably the well, not the best, but one of the best players in the league in 2016, and he's as classic a 10 as you could find anywhere in the world. Now, MLS has gone away from that. I mean, Latif Blessing, Paxton Pomacall, Jamiro Montero is number 10s. Those guys are, are 
they eat ground. So it's it's different, but it's it's something to consider. Final one to close up on here, uh, a guy who bleeds blue, white, and gold, which means that, like Galaxy said, question forming from for these two former players here to my left currently. After watching the Cali Classico, I'm left wondering if some of the players know what these games mean to the fans. Seems like with almost whole new roster, the meaning of some of these rivalries are lost at times. Do they watch hype videos? Do they talk about what this means this past Friday? It felt like the only two were Bingham and Wando who really understood what it means, but then he said maybe that's because my beloved Galaxy lost two in a row to the Smurfs, which is funny because that's what the Red Bulls call NYCFC fans, so I guess if you just don't like someone, you can call them a Smurf, which I enjoyed watching the Smurfs, but when you got to Houston... Let's, when you let, got let's to, let Bobby take this one. No, no, when you got to Houston, how did people explain to you... How did you learn about the rivalry with Dallas? Oh. Uh, or do you not need to? Yeah, it was in Texas, so I figured... <laughs> Yeah, uh, our, our our rival when I played for the Dynamo was not Dallas, yeah. in my opinion. Uh, we were in a different conference <laughs> to start. <laughs> I was in the Eastern Conference. They were in the West. And, um, yeah, Sporting Kansas City was our rivalry, yeah. and nobody had to tell me that there was a rivalry. I didn't need to watch a hype video. No fans came up to me to tell me, like, hey, you should really focus on this match because we were playing meaningful matches to try and get to MLS to, Cup. To piggyback off that point, this is why I have a preference for player-made rivalries. This is why I made right. my comment about Atlanta Red Bulls because it mm -hmm. means more to the players than it does to anyone else. So, yeah, I'm with Kalen. It's more about what you form yourself. It was a great weekend of action. A little mini rivalry week. Toronto beating Montreal. You had New York, New York, New York, New York, New York as well in the Cali Classico. I am very excited about it. A little overwhelmed. At times, we'll be back on Thursday with, as we said, Chris Mueller, a lot more MLS to talk. So send us your emails at extra time at MLSsoccer.com, at extra time radio on Twitter as well. Matt Doyle, Kaylin Carr, Bobby Warshaw, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next Thursday.